to start. First of all, how is everyone? I have been in fabulous sessions, and I am sure you've been in fabulous sessions too. Um, this is our final session for the day, and before we start with our brave scientists, I would like to invite all the volunteers to the core conference up here. All right, do we have the volunteers in the room? If the volunteers could just kindly come to the front of the room, and if you could just introduce yourself and say one sentence, be it your school or what you're working on, um, or what you choose to share about yourself with a larger group here. You just project it out, or we have a mic. Do and and we need a mic. So usually, the, usually you lovely people are carrying the mic. So just pass the mic amongst yourselves, and. We will just start at the far right, please, your name, and, yeah. Uh, my name's uh, Joshua Andy Emanuel, uh, been in a program manager for 15 years plus in public health initiatives, human rights protection, youth development. I'm here to network and to re-engage and to actually explore opportunities. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mary Cruzzi. I'm from the DC area. I'm a global health consultant. Um, I, I do work in Brazil in, in terms of HIV and NCD prevention. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm originally from China and just graduated from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and got my degree in Master of Science in Public Health and Human Nutrition. I'm just doing uh, health communication and education. I'm looking for a job now. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Alkanutra. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Iowa. Before coming to school, I work for Food for the Hungry in World Vision altogether for about um, 10 years, uh, including five years of expatriate position in Mozambique. I'm interested in maternal and child health and, and um, sustainability of community-based interventions. So if you are interested, I'm here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elijah Olivas. I am also at the University of Iowa. I have one more year left for my Master of Public Health. Um, I do research and work in health system strengthening and capacity building, just kind of a lot of different areas. Um, we'll be looking for a job within a year, so keep it in mind. Hi, my name is Emma Cole. I'm also from the University of Iowa College of Public Health. Like Elijah, I have a year left. Um, while uh, my research right now is domestic uh, policy, um, my background is in global health. I um, spent some time in Jordan and India and um, really uh, enjoyed uh, some of the research I did there dealing with water and palliative and hospice care. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Abel Alvarez. I, uh, I'm a physician that I used to be a missionary in Africa, but uh, I decided to go into the global health program to uh, widen my influence in people. Uh, and uh, I'm graduating this weekend on the Global Health Program from Loma Linda University. Hello everyone, my name is Javan Hines. I am a Loma Linda University School of Public Health graduate. Um, it's been about a year now. Um, I got my MPH in Global Health. After that, I was in the Peace Corps um, in Burkina Faso for a little while before becoming evacuated. That's another story. And right now, I'm working with Save the Children um, with their emergency health and nutrition programs doing qualitative data analysis. Hello, my name is Angela Nime. I'm graduating this summer from G George Washington School of Public Health, majoring in health policy. Prior to that, I had about 12 years experience working in Nigeria in health systems, program management, public health program management with organizations like CRS, URC, and I hope to be able to network and get something. Thank you. All right. So thank you to our volunteers, right? Let's get some internships for them, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I hear the labor market's really tight. <laughs> There's some really great people volunteering. Just saying, thank you all. Thank you for this big round. So we're now here for what I understand is a very popular item on the 
Global Practitioner Conference, and it is the 92nd science. And we have here, we have eight brave scientists who in 90 seconds are going to share cutting edge empirical evidence based research and innovation that's gonna make, that makes the world better. And we're going to do this. We have, uh, we'll start with the three categories in our, in the 90 second science. We'll start with testing lab. You'll hear from two scientists, two, three. We may be missing one of our colleagues at the moment. Is Mamta here? Perhaps not, maybe one colleague could make it. We'll start with two, back to back, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. We'll go to the second set of um, scientists who will report out on nutrition, again, followed by some Q&A for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then to the third, focused on community health workers and design slash approaches. And um, yeah, so we're gonna be kicked off by Denish Murthy of the USAID funded Spring Project. Thank you, Denish. Do I have the slide? Do you have this? And the slides are all here. And I think if you just hit. Is that you? Yes, that is me. Or do you want. Wait, that's, that, these that's, are the three in your session, yeah. and then we're going to come to. That's it? Okay. Perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, with apologies to Lynn Manuel Miranda. I am going to make my presentation to the beat of uh, Cabinet Battle Number no. One from the musical Hamilton. Okay, I start. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you could have been anywhere in the world tonight, but you're here with us in Bethesda, Maryland. Are you ready for a 90 second science session? The issue on the table, hemoglobin results from HemoQ are not accurate, and what can we do about it? I have the floor, and I'll tell you all about it. Differences in how we do hemoglobin measurement, HemoQ analyzer, blood capillary, and venous. In our analysis, we compared all of them for cuts under fry, you know we need them. Look at our results. HemoQ hemoglobin is definitely less, whether me measured in blood, capillary, or venous except hemoglobin on the 301 plus capillary. Ooh, in the young ones, measure it. Children under two, what is lowering it? Uh, among the anemic, I'm afraid, capillary and hemoQ make it less. In hemoglobin, small differences and large anemia link. What causes the variation around? Must be the milking of the blood finger found. One anemia cutoff for all children cannot stand. There exist differences in venous and capillary. We need to mind these when measuring nutritionally. Look, there's a lot riding on this value. Imagine what can happen when it fool you. Know what you're measuring hemoglobin? Measure twice, cut once, carefully. Thanks, Brian. Move over, Lynn Manuel, we say. <laughs> There's a new man in town. <laughs> um, um, now we're moving to Marjorie to t from Catholic Relief Services, Mali, on engaging new actors to address the problem of safe specimen transport in Mali from a pilot experience in Sikasso region. I do not have a musical interlude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, oh. Karma, can we? Oh, missed. Oh, is it this one? Okay. Got it. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Go. Um, good afternoon. I'm here to present um, a pilot study that was done by Catholic Relief Services in Mali looking at engaging new actors in specimen transport um, from district to national level. Um, in Mali, the, ad, uh, the transport system is largely ad hoc and relies on public transport, um, which leads to long transit times as well as biosafety and biosecurity risks while the samples are in transport. Um, and so in our intervention, which was funded by the CDC Global Health Security Agenda, um, we contracted and trained private postal service providers to rapidly transfer specimens from uh, three district hospitals to the national level reference lab and provided the community health centers in those districts with motorcycles and specimen transport kits 
to uh, take care of the community to district level transport. We are interested in the time to arrival, the condition of the samples on arrival, as well as the costs of the two systems. We found that the samples uh, transported by the post arrived in 72 hours, 71% of the time, versus only 46% of the time for public transport, which was statistically significant. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of condition on arrival, 96% of specimens arrived in good condition versus 93% on public transport, so the difference was not really that large. The cost was actually higher for the post, but um, it was difficult to compare because we used a fixed fee mechanism with the post versus a per specimen mechanism which is typically used with public transport. So the post is a promising partner in specimen transport that the government of Mali is considering um, as it reforms its civil transport system and cost optimization is necessary to um, improve. Yeah. Thank you. Manta? So we have Manta Rajabanchi from on the effect of bladder and lumbar stimulation technique for collection of urine in newborns. Tamara, we might need your help just to get us back in. Sure. It's on a flash drive, yeah. We're not counting seconds while this happens. <laughs> Go. Good afternoon. My name is Mamta Razvansi and I'm here to present a study on the effect of bladder and lumbar stimulation technique for collection of urine in newborns. Uh, this was an experimental study done in BP Koirala Institute of Health Sciences, Dharan, Nepal, including 54 term newborns. Um, the study was conducted with the objective to determine the effect of bladder and lumbar stimulation technique to collect midstream urine in newborns. The primary objective being uh, the success rate of urine collection and the secondary outcome being the time taken to collect the midstream urine. And the second objective was to determine the contamination rate of the uh, urine samples collected by this method. Mm -hmm. And blood and number stimulation technique was applied in the experimental group as shown in the figure. Here the figure one shows bladder stimulation. The second figure shows paravertebral lumbar massage. And you can see in the figure number three, the baby passing urine and collection of midstream urine collection. And the study showed that the success rate was significantly higher in the experimental group than in the control group. And the median time for sample collection being 64.2 seconds, which was um, less than that of the control group. And uh, in conclusion, the study suggests that the bladder and lumbar stimulation technique is safe quick and effective way of collecting midstream urine in newborns. Thank you very much. I feel like everybody's ready for TED Talks. <laughs> Lynn, Lynn Manuel Moran, Broadway and TED Talks. Um, we're opening it up. That concludes the three presentations for Testing Lab. And we open up to the room for any questions, any clarifications any innovations you wish to share. And we have about 10 minutes for this. Please. Thank you for your presentation. My question is to the last speaker. Um, what, is the, what was the control group? Well, uh, thank you very much for your question. Well, uh, in the control group, uh, after feeding the newborns, 25 minutes after feeding the newborns, their genitals and perineal areas were cleaned um, and they were just held under the armpit with legs dangling for five minutes. Whereas in experimental group, 25 minutes after feeding, uh, their genital and perineal areas were cleaned and the newborns were held under the armpit with legs dangling and bladder stimulation was done by gently tapping the suprapubic area at the frequency of 100 taps per minute for 30 seconds followed by lumbar paravertebral massage done for 30 seconds and these two maneuvers were done um, uh, alternately for five minutes until the baby passes urine. 
so uh, we found that uh, the success rate was significantly higher which was 88.8 percent um, in uh, uh, experimental group whereas it was a 25.92 in the control group okay. thank you very much I have a question yeah uh, for, this is for Danish I'm sorry, I can't ask the other question with a backbeat and rhyme, but, uh, but uh, could you explain just a little bit about the significance of the difference in these two measurement techniques and uh, what does that actually mean programmatically? Uh, my bad singing notwithstanding, this is a really important issue. Uh, what we have, HemoQ is a portable device to measure hemoglobin used all over the world to determine uh, a hemoglobin concentration in children and adults, and then it's compared against a cutoff to determine anemia. So what we have here is measuring hemoglobin measured on a hemoQ using a capillary blood sample, which is what is always usually done, against venous blood measured on what we consider a reference gold standard a hematology autoanalyzer. And what we find is hemoQ uh, significantly uh, shows a lower value of hemoglobin which means that it translates into when you're using HemoQ as your go-to device for determining anemia, you're going to have a higher rate of anemia as when measured against a gold standard, which means it could be possible unless we have, unless we take measures to make sure that that measurement error doesn't creep in, it could be possible that we're making more people anemic than they actually are metabolically. Using, if you're using only the HemoQ. Yes. Is that a follow-up question? We, so we tried. We tried to see what, what um, we had seven data sets. We had uh, 11 data sets from nine countries, of which we could use only uh, data sets from seven countries. And we didn't exactly identify the, we were using secondary data collected for other source, for other uh, purposes. Uh, we never had a data set that looked explicitly at comparing hemo the various factors that affect hemoglobin in hemoQ versus the various factors that affect hemoglobin in a venous sample. So just based on those, what we found was measurement error and age. Uh, in the children under five, we found that children who are between the ages of six to 11 months and children in the 12 to 23 age group show a lower hemoglobin as compared to those who are over the age of two. Uh, so that was uh, children under two, what is causing the variation is uh, it could be the way you collect blood. In children less than one year, you take a heel prick. And in children less, uh, more, than, more than one year, you, you might take a heel prick or you might take a finger prick. So when, when uh, it's, it's really difficult to get a blood sample from very young children. <coughs> So you, uh, what, what people tell, tend to do is, in, if it's a finger, they tend to milk the finger, which introduces plasma into your sample. So you're not really measuring hemoglobin. You're measuring hemoglobin that's been diluted by plasma. So that could be a major source of measurement error when you're using the HemoQ. The HemoQ as a device is pretty accurate, but it is uh, the sample that you put into the HemoQ will give you the result and the hemo hemoglobin concentration. Thank you. Any more questions for the testing lab group? Please. Because it's not exactly the same. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, in this study, we found that uh, there were significantly higher number of males than females uh, as um, the setting I have mentioned, it's a referral center and in Nepal, you know, basically uh, um, the male child, they are given a more priority and uh, we found that uh, uh, success rate, it was significantly higher in the males than in females, but that might be because of the um, uh, sample itself because we had higher number of males than females. Thank you very much. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. A huge round of applause for our testing lab scientists. Thank you. And I'm going to invite our nutrition scientists, please, starting with um, Yes, okay. I've also just been asked to please ask the audience to wait for the mics. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for that, and thank you for the reminder to me as well. Um, the nutrition, so we'll start with Bethany. Bethany, tell me when you're ready and when you have your slides up. Bethany Marin with the International Rescue Committee on Treating Malnutrition in the Community, um, a feasibility study of low literate community health workers treating severe acute malnutrition in South Sudan. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. Families in humanitarian contexts face major barriers to healthcare access, such as distance, extreme weather, insecurity, and the opportunity costs of care seeking. To address this issue in areas where education access is also very limited, uh, we developed a set of job aids and protocols adapted to low literacy to see if low literate community health workers can successfully provide treatment for severe acute malnutrition from their homes. We conducted the pilot study in Awil, South County, South Sudan um, and trained 57 community health workers. Half of them scored perfectly on a post-training assessment and 91% of them passed overall. Then 44% or 44 rather of the highest performing uh, CHWs were deployed into their communities and treated a total of 308 severely malnourished children. The recovery rate from severe to moderate acute malnutrition was 91% and the recovery rate from severe to full recovery was 75%. These recovery rates outperformed the nearest outpatient clinics despite the fact that children treated by CHWs um, were often admitted at a worse status of malnutrition. Our findings highlight the potential of low literate CHW cadres to provide critical life-saving services if programs are properly adapted to literacy levels, education levels, and cultural norms. The IRC is currently supporting pilots of four other NGOs who are implementing uh, similar protocols in three countries. And uh, we look forward to following up with additional work to test the scalability of this approach. Thank you. Thank you. I could invite Sarah. Our next scientist is Sarah Straubinger from USAID's Maternal and Child Survival Program. Mm -hmm. And Sarah is talking about the integration of nutrition into integrated community case management in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. DRC has some of the highest rates of child malnutrition and mortality. Problems around childhood malnutrition and mortality are exacerbated by a lack of trained healthcare workers, difficulty to access healthcare due to geographic constraints and costs, and a lack of security. Integration of in nutrition into ICCM provides an opportunity at the community level to improve and strengthen IYCF and care practices, nutritional status, and reduce rates of childhood morbidity and mal morbidity and malnutrition. In partnership with the Ministry of Health and the Programme National de Nutrition, MCSP conducted formative research to understand the behaviors, perceptions, and beliefs around child illness and nutrition and how these influence feeding and care-seeking practices in DRC. Findings from in-depth interviews and focus group discussions revealed that concepts of children's health and growth and nutrition are strongly linked. Breastfeeding has a favorable image among communities in this study. Diminished quantity and quality of breast milk are linked to illness in children. Mothers need to work in the field led to early introduction of foods before six months of age, and children's diets were primarily lacking in animal source protein-rich foods, and quantities of food were small in comparison to the needs of young children. These findings indicate that understanding health needs from the point of view of the community and designing community-level services is critical to addressing families' needs and ensuring utilization of services. The study findings are now informing a pilot approach to integrate nutrition into ICCM and strengthen IYCF pra practices at the community level in Chobo province by MCSP. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and if I can invite Heather Stobel, did I pronounce mm -hmm. well, from RTI International to talk about, share with us relapse following treatment for acute malnutrition. How big is the problem? How can we capture it? Um, most treatment programs for acute malnutrition focus on initial recovery only, leaving little to no knowledge about what happens to the child following initial discharge. Mm -hmm. But a small body of evidence is emerging demonstrating poor post-discharge outcomes after initial recovery, including relapse back to acute malnutrition. 
In order to find an appropriate and scalable solution to tackle relapse, we first need to identify the overall burden of relapse and better understand risk factors and consequences of relapse. Together with the No Wasted Lives Initiative, RTI conducted a systematic review of literature aimed to capture relapse rates in children following initial recovery from SAM. We found 26 reports with re relapse ranging from anywhere from 0 to 37% over various lengths of follow-up periods. Some conclusions that we found are that relapse is poorly defined and scarcely measured. Relapse rates are largely not comparable due to different treatment protocols, follow-up periods, and relapse indicators. The highest rates of relapse occur in the first six months following discharge from initial treatment, and lower anthropometric measurements during treatment are associated with relapse, and illness is frequently observed at the time of relapse. We need a standardized definition of relapse. Research programs and policies need to shift the focus of acute malnutrition treatment from not only achieving immediate recovery to achieving sustained recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's open it up for questions for our nutrition scientists. And um, please wait till the mic comes to you. Thank you. <laughs> to this table over here, please, in the back. Um, I have a question for the first presenter um, around the uh, simplified protocols and tools. Can you tell us a little bit about how those protocols and tools are actually different from the standard? Mm -hmm. And also, if they performed well, why not simplify the tools and protocols at the clinic level as well? Sure. So the tool, uh, this toolkit that we developed is, was developed specifically um, for a cadre of a low literacy cadre of health workers. So um, the register, the MUAC tool, which measures mid upper arm circumference, as well as the uh, Salter scale, which determines the child's dosage of receiving RUTF, um, requires uh, no literacy. Um, it's pictorial icons, um, and it follows a. Um, yeah, a, a method wherein uh, community health workers don't have to rely on words. Um, as far as why we didn't uh, do that at the health facility level, so one of the kind of goals of this project would, was to decentralize the treatment and so to bring it to the community level. Uh, the community health workers that we worked with um, are uh, more than five kilometers from their health facility. Uh. <clears throat> Uh, I'm a Conan from Catholic Relief Service. Uh, I really thank all the presenters. I'm so sorry. I apologize, Andrew. If you could just say your name. Okay. All, my, all of you who speak. That my name is McConnell from Catholic Relief Service. My question goes to the first presenter. Yeah. Uh, how could the community volunteers could identify complications? Because usually there are some complications like hypoglycemia, hypothermia, even minor uh, moderate dehydration that they could overlook. So in that instance, how do they manage uh, the, the management? Thank you. Sure. Uh, that's a really important question. And in the 90-minute version of the presentation, um, I, would, I would have shared that uh, the community health workers that we were working with were um, previously trained and um, uh, implementing um, ICCM at the community level. Um, so they were trained to identify uh, danger signs, the danger signs associated with ICCM conditions. Um, and so we uh, applied those same uh, strategies to assess danger signs um, and kind of applied them towards the treatment uh, or uh, identification of signs before treating for malnutrition. And this is Wendy Diamond from Medair. And I just had a question. Sorry to monopolize the first presentation. Um, so I'm all for that expansion of coverage for ICCM with nutrition, especially in South Sudan. But I was just curious, your results were better than the local clinic, which I can say doesn't surprise me. But I was curious what the um, inputs were. Was it equal training for both and refresher training with that comparison? Or was that run by someone else? And just to see the comparison between that part. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So um, as a feasibility study, as a pilot study, um, the comparison with the health facility was not a kind of a rigorous process, to be honest. Um, it was more like a collection of uh, register data and some qualitative work. So um, we didn't uh, specifically, um, we, we didn't mean to specifically uh, compare 
the results um, in terms of, yeah, if uh, there was equal training and uh, supervision. Mm -hmm. There's a question from the gentleman from Niger, then Lisa. Uh, my, my question is about the first uh, presenter, uh, about the difference between uh, this, uh, 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 the rate, who is very high uh, uh, from uh, uh, one to, to another. Uh, it's a great result or you take uh, in consideration some potential confusion factors. As we know that uh, most of the treatment at the uh, community level are simple cases and the complicated cases are transferred at the health facility. Of course, if uh, it's the complicated cases with transfer as the, uh, of the facility, uh, of the health facility is normal that the, it might be normal that the, the, the cases of uh, death will be uh, much, uh, much higher. I, I think it's something that we need to look for if it is uh, uh, addressed or, or not. Uh, and uh, with the, in practice, even between the uh, uh, OTP, uh, the outpatient therapeutic program, and the inpatient therapeutic program, most of the time the the, the death rate is higher in the uh, the inpatient therapeutic program, and we know that in the inpatient therapeutic program we have uh, uh, a high level uh, of uh, the technical plateau. I don't know. Uh, the, the technique, we have the high level of technique, uh, uh, technical resources. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you raise a good point about the condition of children when they're admitted um, for treatment. So um, first of all, I, I'll start with your kind of second point, which is that we were only looking at um, treatment of uncomplicated SAM, so um, treatment that would happen at the OTP, and then in this case, we decentralized it to the community health workers. But we actually found um, that among the 308 children that were enrolled by the CHWs, that 30% of them um, had a MUAC uh, mid upper arm circumference, sorry, of less than 10.25, which for is quite low, um, and was lower um, than what we were seeing um, the admission uh, or the status of children that were admitted into the OTP or at the facility level. Um, so, doesn't quite answer your question um, because we weren't necessarily looking at um, you know complicated complicated cases, but just anecdotally to share that. Um, we were reaching kids who are at a worse uh, status of malnutrition. Thank you to everyone. I know it's challenging to do it in 90 seconds. My question's for Sarah. Sarah, I know DRC can uh, wax and wane between conflict and development. Um, so keeping in the theme with our conference, we know integration is so important. Can you comment on how challenging it might have been given the context in DRC? Um, with your program. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so the particular part of DRC where we were conducting this study did not specifically, um, was not in a conflict zone. However, one challenge that we did face towards the end of data collection was um, there was an Ebola outbreak not far from the study area. So luckily, um, that particular part of DRC was very remote, but it was um, one of the challenges we faced. Does that answer your question? How did you deal with it again? So did, did things have to stop temporarily? No, we did not have to stop, but we did have to um, proceed with caution, and there were we were foreseeing potential <laughs> delays with finishing um, data collection and initiating data analysis. Thank you. We have a question here at the next table. Hi, uh, I'm Elijah again from the University of Iowa. Is it not me? No, after you. Oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> just making sure. Okay, hi, Elijah, University of Iowa College of Public Health. Uh, my question is for the last presenter. Um, I was just curious. I noticed that it says that uh, illness is associated with the relapse uh, after discharge, and I was wondering whether it was identified that that was sustained, or if that was just a temporary relapse, or if it made any distinction either way. Sorry, 
sorry, can you clarify your question is if the relapse was sustained? Yeah, if it was uh, treated, if, it, if the relapse was just a temporary relapse, if the illness um, kind of reversed and then it, it fixed itself eventually, or if uh, the, the um, severe malnutrition was sustained after that for a long period of time. Right, so in this study, because it was a, a review, it was a kind of a compilation of lots of different studies, um, and so it's a good point to bring up the definition of relapse. Um, this was relapsed to specifically to severe acute malnutrition. And in many of the studies that um, if they collected additional indicators at the time of when a child relapsed, many of them also noticed that there was some kind of illness present. Um, it was just, it's just a, that's not a statistically significant result. It's just a very common observation among the studies that we saw. Um, when we do talk about relapse, many of these studies um, define it as the first relapse or just following up with a child at one point in time, and you say, oh, they, they relapsed once. Well, you only followed them up at one month, or at nine months. So what happened to them for the first nine months? So there, there are multiple relapses that occur frequently. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, gentleman at the table behind Lisa. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Hilary. I work for Episcopal Leaf and Development in the Basin of Ghana. Uh, the first presenter, I was wondering uh, whether there were instances that the community health workers referred some cases to the health facilities. And also, secondly, um, in some settings, the community health workers are linked to the government formal health system. How did you manage those linkages? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we uh, did have a referral mechanism in place. So uh, first off, uh, children would be referred uh, to the health facility if any if they presented with any danger signs or failed their appetite test. Um, but secondly, um, we had some uh, or a protocol in place where uh, children would be referred to the health facility or the OTP if their uh, mid upper arm circumference didn't uh, move enough. So we we set a standard um, within four weeks time. Um, so that was part of the part of the protocol and part of the program. As far as working with the community <coughs> health workers, um, so these community health workers were um, uh, already providing ICCM services uh, through the you know with the Ministry of Health and through support um, from the IRC. Uh, so we uh, worked with them on this specific kind of short-term study um, to add this uh, kind of the integrate or to add the treatment of acute malnutrition. Thank you. A huge round of applause for our nutrition scientists. Thank you very much. Um, and our next set is on communi community health workers and design approach. And Ochia Wunma Ibe, um, USAID's Maternal and Child Survival Project, will talk about the community health worker coverage and capacity tool the operational missing link in CHW policy to implementation. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm presenting on behalf of myself and Eric Sariot of Save the Children. So the Community Health Worker Coverage and Capacity C3 tool, its application in Egypt, operational missing link, CHW planning and implementation. The Excel-based C3 tool was applied in Egypt to tailor the CHW strategy for maximum impact in Manufia Governorate. MCSP convened program leaders from the Ministry of Health and Population at governorate and central level, along with CHW supervisors, to brainstorm on how to link the two, the op operational strategy and implementation, over a two-day workshop. The participants deliberated assumptions that go into the tools such as CHW time use, the service packages, and populations to prioritize for coverage. As you can see, the C3 tool tested different scenarios, making trade-offs more explicit. For example, on your right, on your left, on both sides, of the, um, on the left of the slide, shows a comparison of two scenarios that differ as to which subpopulations and conditions that are targeted for home visits. Scenario one in blue includes more home visits but will result in lower coverage. 
whereas scenario two in orange would give us more coverage and the services are selected are selective you can see the table below scenario, um, scenario one and scenario two the services that were included for home visits for the different scenarios on the right side of the slide you see the population of community health workers that they had and the time chw time use is that it Oh, okay, just to say that what this um, application, the re recommendation that came out of the meeting was that the, um, the CHW planners decided to choose services that were selective that would give them more impact and apply more of the CHW time, time use with home visits. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now Margaret Brawley from Medicines for Humanity will take us through community health workers driving greater access to services and improved health outcomes in an urban Haitian community. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Haiti has the highest infant and child mortality rates in the Western Hemisphere. Between 200, 2015 and 2017, Medicines for Humanity implemented a capacity building project with 12 congregations of Catholic sisters. Trainings were given on IMCI, nutrition for pregnant women, nutrition for children, project management skills, and also how to teach traditional birth attendants on danger signs and referring women to clinics. The endline evaluation involved focus group discussions, pre and post test scores, clinical chart review for pediatric patri patients, and a household survey of female caregivers. The overall evaluation results showed that the knowledge and skills of nearly all the participants improved around maternal health, IMCI, and nutrition. We also saw a decrease in the number of children that were presenting with fever, respiratory infections, and diarrhea. And at the same, so same time, we saw the treatment-seeking behaviors for those same illnesses was very high. 90% of women surveyed reported in the area that they had seen a CHW within the last two months. And what was very interesting is that the women that had seen CHWs on a regular basis reported that they were seeking services before pregnancy, after pregnancy, and delivering at a facility um, more significantly. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, CHWs proved to be an effective link between the community and the health facility, and there's great value in the integration of those two to improve maternal and child health outcomes. Thank you to all my colleagues who helped on the study. And we have handouts if you'd like more details. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a final presenter, Samantha Kerr from Population Services International, on using design thinking to bringing health closer to youth. Thank you, Samantha. So pictured here are some of the brilliant minds working with PSI to influence the perception and uptake of voluntary modern contraception among adolescents across the developing world. And they happen to be the end users, too. Human-Centered Design, or HCD, is all about getting closer to them, to our consumer, really walking in their shoes, stepping literally into their communities, thinking and feeling through their realities, and identifying insights about key health behaviors to co-design and test creative solutions. And good news, it's working. For example, through HCD, girls in Nigeria, Tanzania, and Ethiopia told our Adolescence 360 project that they viewed contraception as irrelevant, harmful, at odds with their dreams of motherhood. These insights fueled A360's blueprint for change. Supporting a girl's emotional decision to use contraceptives as a first step to achieving her immediate goals. In Nicaragua, Youth Voices informed how PSI redesigned clinic services to be more friendly to youth and to first-time mothers, resulting in an increase in new clients and first-time users of family planning among adolescents. So HCD is helping us to imagine and realize a world where adolescents can adopt a contraceptive method through a single brief contact. So we invite you to join us in empathizing with your consumers, mm -hmm. generating insights not for them, but with them, mm -hmm. and prototyping rapid fire solutions that can be redefined and taken to scale. Adolescents are not just the future, but they are the present, and they are a powerful force for global health. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And as, again, we open up the floor for questions for our last three scientists.
and, and any of you preparing questions, just raise your hand so our volunteers can bring you a mic so you're ready. Presenters, okay. Uh, my question is for the first one, Dr. Ochi. Uh, how did you calculate the time, the travel time in this case? Um, do you want to sit here? I know. We, don't, we actually need a roving mic up here. <laughs> but, um, please. Uh, Thank you. That's an excellent question. And uh, we didn't do a time use study, so that was part of the deliberations that the program leaders had to do in terms of what assumptions to be made to insert in that time. So it was a really um, long conversation between the, the our, our supervisors who are directly in touch with the community health workers in Egypt called Refiat Radiat. And then, you know, also um, comparing that with the protocol in terms of what their, the service delivery package, what is expected, what the training does. But in other settings like in um, um, Sierra Leone where we try to apply the, CHW, um, the C3 tool, there's been some study that, you know, in terms that UNICEF had done trying to collect the data that it takes to do different things and travel distances. Um, there was a question here, gentlemen from Niger. Yes, my question is uh, about the first presenter, about the home visit for uh, children under five who have stunting. Uh, the, the, the question is about uh, the, the scaling up of uh, these home visits after the study, uh, because we uh, it's a, a, a big issue about the age of the, the children in the in the community, especially in uh, in Africa, where uh, the, the the population uh, the children don't have uh, health care, and uh, the, we, we don't know exactly the age that uh, they have. It is easier for someone who did uh, a school to 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 understand it and. Uh, calculate the, the, the age with uh, using calendar and other things, but it's much complicated for a uh, uh, community health worker. So I, the question is to how to address this issue. Thank you. Okay. If I get you right, you're saying how did the community health workers determine who was two years? Is that, is, uh, or children under two? I, I didn't, I'm not sure I got the question right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Au suivi des personnes qui ont des enfants de moins de 5 ans avec la malnutrition, la malnutrition chronique, surtout pour les volontaires. On sait que en termes d'utilisation du calendrier saisonnier, parce qu'on n'a pas fréquemment euh, euh, les dates de naissance de ces enfants puisque les carnets ne sont pas disponibles. Et donc, on est obligé d'utiliser un outil plus souvent le calendrier saisonnier pour déterminer l'âge. Et les, les, les volontaires n'ont pas forcément euh, toutes les compétences requises pour lire toute une grande page ou voir deux pages ou trois pages de calendrier saisonnier et faire le rapport et retrouver l'âge de l'enfant. C'est ça la question Okay, that exceeds my French knowledge, but I think I understand what you're asking. Just to, in, in, in reference to the presentation, we didn't do any study. What we, what, what we were comparing was the time assumptions that the package is expected to be delivered by the community health workers in Egypt in their setting. So based on that particular, in the Egypt setting, the CHWs only do health promotion. They don't do any treatment. And so it's really to communicate at home visit level to the, a, tech, a selected group of, you know, um, community members, whether that would um, give them better impact than providing the whole um, list that you saw on, on scenario one, which had a lot more service packages to be delivered rather than just being selective to, to target mothers of children under two. Uh, so I don't know if my answer is, it, it's okay with you, but we didn't do any studies. 
Thank you very much. We had a yes, please. Um, thank you very much. My name is Zaditu Radegoke, and I work um, for Health Partners International, DAI Global Health. Uh, my question is also to the first uh, presenter. Um, it's possible I got your pie chart a bit confused, and I was thinking uh, for community health workers to spend about 25% of their time on administ administrative activities. If you would like to shed a bit more light on what they do, because I I'm just looking at it in terms of the push for tax shifting in developing countries. What do they use their time for when we talk about administrative activities and the implication of what we're trying to do globally? Thank you. Thank you for that question. And it was, it was something that came out as the, we're having these discussions. The, one of the things they consider was how do they reduce that time use for administrative and administrative includes reporting in the setting of in, in Egypt setting they the, the um, RRs the refer were died they, they go to the health facility they report at the health facility first and they tend to help the health um, health workers at the health facility do some administrative work before they even go out to do the home visits so those were the considerations that they had to make if we want them to have more impact what are we going to do in, in terms of this time use okay you see 21% um, uh, um, of their time is used for travel could they stop them from reporting to the health facility every morning before they go out to do their homework so those are things that you know they had to look discuss in terms of trade-offs to be able to get them to have more in time doing home visits and get better impact thank you we had a question from you and Hi. I'll take the last one from, from the gentleman, but we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, so my question, uh, my name is Anushka Kuryanpur. I'm with CARE. Uh, my question is for the speaker from PSI. First, thank you so much for bringing up the importance of meaningful participation of adolescents and really working with adolescents and not just for them. Um, so my question is two parts. One. Um, it, earlier today we had a panel on inclusive SRH programming and we talked about the diverse needs of different groups of adolescents. So I was wondering um, what specific group of adolescents you were targeting and whether this, this issue came up about you know, needing to target different groups. And then uh, part B of my question is um, have you guys thought about using um, human-centered design for uh, youth in crisis settings, particularly given the challenges related to their mobility? Thank you. Really great questions. Thank you. Um, we don't currently do a lot of work in crisis situations specifically. Um, so no, we haven't explored applications in that context. Um, in terms of groups of adolescents we're working with, um, the Adolescents 360 project in Tanzania, Nigeria, and Ethiopia primarily targets married girls between the ages of 15 and 19. Um, there is a component that also addresses um, some work with unmarried girls. And then in Nicaragua, our project specifically looks at first-time mothers who in Nicaragua often are adolescents girls between the ages of 15 and 19. Um, our goal there was to look at how could we empower girls before a second unplanned pregnancy. Um, in our work with long-acting contraceptives, we noticed that a lot of women were adopting an IUD or an implant after already having a, a second or third child at a young age, 23 or 24. Um, so we wanted to develop some insights around opportunities for um, working with first-time mothers um, and letting them know that we weren't leaving them behind. We had one last question from this table. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the presenters. My question, my question goes to the first and the second presenters. I didn't see any mention of uh, the referral linkage. The referral linkage is an important component of community-based health and nutrition intervention, be it the home visiting, follow-up, community sensitization or community mobilization, whatever. So I didn't see any mention. Thank you. Um, actually, in, sorry, actually in, in our evaluation and part of the training that we did, there was training on um, not only the messaging but also the referrals back to the eight clinics. So that was discussed um, when they should refer and, and what types of things they sh should, should be looking at to refer. So there was that linkage between the CHWs referring back to the clinics. If I may just add that um, for the package in Egypt, the referral is linked, is, is embedded in the messaging that is done in the home visits. The, 
the community health workers don't do any treatment at all, so it's just health promotion and re referral to the health facility. Okay. Um, we are going to soon close out this session with a 58 second video that's about to follow. But in the meantime, I would love for you all to stand and give a standing ovation to our brave scientists. It takes a lot of courage to do a 90 seconds. Standing. <laughs>